history. Good evening. Um, I'm going to ask for a uh, motion to come out of non-public, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Amanda. And if I could have a roll call vote starting from my left. Hi, Kevin Gray. Hi, Tim Porter. Hi, Bob Slater. Hi, Sarah Laughlin. Hi, Amanda Butcher. Thank you, folks. Um, we will now continue with our meeting uh, as we have a non-public session uh, starting at 7 p.m. Uh, until now. Uh, we're going to get right into the consent agenda, and we have one retirement for Carolyn Roy. So. Mrs. Carolyn Roy will retire after 18 years of service as a computer science teacher at Lenendary Middle School. She will complete her experience teaching an innovative and self-designed curriculum for eighth grade students, creative technology and media. This popular offering drew technology media-driven students to her classroom and in 2013 was selected to have a Four Walls Media Marketing Group to work with her class for the entire year. Highlights of Carolyn's work include creating LMS videos with students, such as a sixth grade orientation, Rock the Test, and a related arts commercial. In addition to these accomplishments, Carolyn's classes have been recognized for winning the What's Cool About Manufacturing Statewide Video Contest by capturing third place with Stonyfield Yogurt first place with KMC Systems, and first place with Bird's Eye Aerobotics. Over the last two years, Carolyn took an active role in highlighting student work in the related arts department by showcasing Worlds of Excellence, by creating and launching the LMS Eye of the Storm website, opening a pathway for our community to see the incredible work by LMS students. Carolyn is a Keene State graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Management. Before her teaching experience, she worked in the private sector for 21 years as a technical support specialist and senior system analyst at Sigma, Peerless Insurance Company in Sylvania. She earned a master's degree from Southern New Hampshire University in business education while earning her teacher certification as a computer science educator. It has been a privilege to have her as a teacher with extensive experience in the technology field in her classroom where students had access to the fantastic opportunity that she provided for students over the past 18 years. On behalf of the Londonary School District and the community, we wish Ms. Carolyn Roy the best in her retirement. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Moving on with our consent agenda. Upcoming meetings, May 7, 2024, a regular meeting uh, at right here at the, I believe it's in the cafe, it's not on the agenda, but I think we're back in the cafe. And May 21st, 2024, another regular meeting right in the cafe at 7 p.m. Could I have a motion to accept the consent agenda, please? So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Tim. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye sir. <coughs> Thank you. And we're going to just jump up a little bit here. We're going to bring in, um, we're going to go to 7.1 um, so we can do school board liaisons first and then uh, the student representative, which we have uh, Miss Laurel. Got three here tonight, filling in for uh, Dylan. So we'll get to you in a second there, and I'll start with the board with any uh, liaisons. I do not have any updates. Okay. Just for um, Leonard Middle School, so the eighth graders left for DC this morning, should be there now, um, which is exciting. Spring sports are well underway. The spring music concerts are coming up Saturday, May 11th. An eighth grade promotion ceremony, which will take place at the high school gym, will be on Wednesday, June 12th at 1230. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Tim? Yeah, um, also on the middle school, um, we were kind of let know, um, notified last minute about the financial literacy activity uh, called C4 Reality uh, yesterday that took place in the middle school gymnasium. I was able to pop over for about an hour yesterday morning. Uh, it was a really great interactive activity that they had take place for all the, the eighth grade students um, basically and i know jen jen LaBranche had invited us over there she's in dc now with the students otherwise I, i'd ask her to come up um, but essentially what happened was they had each of the students choose an occupation um, and partnering with saint mary's bank um, they had a lot of employees come over from the different branches around and each of the students were given a sheet that showed their chosen occupation, the entry level um, salary that was projected for them, 
and in reality showing them how much would be withheld for taxes at the top um, for FICA and then what they would have for projected take-home pay per month and then they had to go around to stations all around the room for an hour and a half and choose in practicality how much their life would cost if they were choosing this much to pay for food this much to pay for housing if they were renting or buying uh, the insurance that they would have to have to go along with that in each state each section of their life to show them that this is what actually your chosen profession would afford you and if at the end of it they got down to it on their spreadsheet and they had a deficit they then had to go back and see where they had to maybe cut back on their chosen Netflix subscription or um, maybe you can't have coffee every day of the week as you're going to work uh, I just think it, it was a really great lesson to show them um, how the money actually translates and how important it is that yeah it's great to choose the profession but you have to know what you're getting into and know where you're going to have to make sacrifices in the real world as opposed to just what you might envision right now so it uh, and it really did seem to impact them um, in showing them what it would be like in reality so I, I love that they do that I know that they didn't do that when I went through the junior high here at the time um, so to get them ready for the real world I think it was a great activity it's great thanks Tim. Uh, just a quick update on some of the events at North. Um, <clears throat> so for all of the elementary schools, the LMS this past Saturday was the um, Reflections Art Show, which was fantastic from three to five. Um, all of the student houses and artwork was displayed. It was pretty amazing for everyone to get to go and take a look. They wanted an amazing job. Um, this past Friday was Dodgeball Day, which was always a lot of fun. Thursday prior to that was their school play, the uh, creators put on Dicket, which was a very good production. Uh, we only got a chance to see it. Uh, and some of the upcoming stuff they're planning for right now is this, the book fair and ice cream social coming May 6th and through the 8th of believe, and then staff appreciation week coming out week as well. Great. Thank you, Kevin. And I've just got a couple of updates. Um, Lynn Wiles presented to us uh, about a month ago from the Utilities Committee on the town side. And I know he's been in conversation with Lisa and Alan over the past some time and sent some information. And he'd like to meet with, uh, with, with the business agent and, uh, and the superintendent in the near future with some uh, metering rebate program that the town has signed up and, and has some good cost savings. So, um, if it's okay, I'll have him reach out to you guys and uh, see if it makes sense for us. He thinks there's, you know, possible significant savings um, getting part of that program. Um, he sent some stuff, so I'll forward you that email that he sent me uh, earlier today. Um, and I appreciate him keeping keeping us up to date on that. A uh, little update on the building committee for Moose Hill. Um, Good news is, is I heard back from four of the original committee members are, are in for whatever uh, you may need, Dan, and, and the school board. And uh, I've reached out to the alternate to see. I haven't heard back from Mr. Penta yet to see if he's willing to, to fill in that fifth spot. Um, so I'll keep you updated. And I know we want to set a date, um, I would say probably middle of May, so maybe we could come up with a date. Um, in that uh, maybe one night for a parent forum at Moose Hill and the building committee attend along with a couple of staff and a couple of school board members if there's questions um, just to get a bunch of input from the community members um, for us to, to move forward with that so we're in good shape with that committee and I uh, I, I want to thank the committee members for staying on uh, as they have a lot of knowledge and did a lot of work to get us where we were last year um, and I uh, have spoken with uh, Alan and JR. The girls' softball field is close uh, at the middle school, so I told them to keep me updated. And uh, when this comes to being ready, I'd like to have a little uh, dedication to that field and ceremony and um, you know, kick it off when it's able to be used. Uh, that's a big, been a long time coming for that, that field at the middle school, but they are in, uh, they're getting real close. So hopefully uh, maybe before the season's over or early summer, it'll be ready to go. Um, and that's all I got on that end. So 
finish up with there. And I, we've got a student representative here, Laurel Guthrie, tonight. If you'd like to update us, Laurel, thanks Hi. for coming. I'm Laurel. For those of you that don't know me, I'm like the student body president. Um, so this week for the high school, we have our spirit week. Um, our pep rally is this Friday. Um, tomorrow, we will be doing like a surf and turf day. Um, so it's kind of a competition, like who can get more surf or turf. Um, also tomorrow, the student council will be attending the New Hampshire State District meeting with a few of our members and board members um, to represent London Dairy um, with all the other student councils around the community and in our district. Um, following vacation, um, we have our annual walkathon, which the past three years has been for Kate Sherwood. Um, however, we recognize that my grade is the last grade that knew Kate Sherwood, and she died pretty early on in the year, so it's hard to get a lot of community involvement in an event for someone who, that people don't really know about. So we are moving towards, we are still supporting the Kate Sherwood Foundation, which I'll talk about in a minute. We're moving towards um, inviting clubs to host their events here at our walkathon and raise awareness for things that are important to them. So this year we have the Women Take Action Club, um, who is there to support and raise awareness for um, women's homes and mothers' homes in our community and in our state um, and just in surrounding areas. Um, that club is run by our math teacher, Ms. Veal, um, and it's a relatively new club this last two years um, that she's running with a couple of sophomores. Um, it's been pretty popular amongst the underclassmen and they're hoping to get more awareness for their club and for their purpose. As well as the Women Take Action Club that is going to be there, we have um, the Blue and Purple Star Lancers, which is a very well-known club at our school. We got awards for it last year. Um, they'll be representing military families and homes in the area. Um, I do not know if they decide to raise money or not. Um, student Council will be hosting the Kate Sherwood Foundation, um, which raises money for students that are underprivileged or are new to our school that could use extra help um, in making connections with teachers and facilities. Last year, we were able to um, move this foundation to other surrounding schools at one of our district meetings. Um, so we will again have raffle baskets. Um, this year we're also raising awareness for this event throughout our community and at our elementary schools and um, middle schools, just to try and get more community engagement um, at a larger profile. Student Council, in addition to the raffle baskets that we usually do and hosting the walk, will be doing a tie-dye theme thing, which will raise money for the Sherwood Foundation as well. <laughs> oh, and in the beginning of May, we're doing our candidates meeting um, for next year's board members for student council and all four classes. Okay, great. Laurel, thank you very much, and yeah. sounds like a busy week. Yeah. Enjoy, and have a great vacation. Thank you. All right, we're going to um, we'll hold off on public comment until after our announcements and presentation in case um, our, our large audience here has some questions on, on some of these items. So we'll move into 5.1, uh, the winter 2024 data presentation. And Mr. Parent and colleagues. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna be presenting from here at the hard wire end, okay. but the information's in your packet. Yeah. Obviously you can use um, the screen if you wanna reference that. And I'll be talking from the, the corner here. But I'm pleased to present our winter data results, uh, K to 12, uh, and I'm joined by our curriculum coordinators at the elementary levels, Nicole Treadway, at the middle school level, Megan Mason. At the high school level, Dr. Kim Lindley Susie and Sean Flynn. And even our superintendent is so uh, excited and um, respectful of the work that went into this that he jumped in and added a few few slides to to the 72 that we're going to quickly present to you uh, this evening. That's that's an actual number. So here we go. Welcome everyone. <laughs> So really, our entire academic vision uh, in the Londonderry School System centers around the fortune of a graduate and the 21st century skills uh, that we want our students to be competent and demonstrate. Um, they include communication and collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, and problem solving, self-direction, and engaged citizenship. So these skills are frequently referenced in coursework K-12, to uh, and they're assessed in the main evaluation tools most families and students are familiar with, which are the report cards, um, our progress, and, uh, and the comments that are tied to those competencies and the course content. Um, this is a copy of our Portrait of a Learner, and Nicole's gonna kind of talk about um, that, that breakdown and how our elementary teachers assess, assess that. Sure. 
Um, so as Jay said, this is a copy of the Portrait of a Learner, which we adopted really this fall. We took what was the learner behaviors on the elementary report card um, and aligned them K to five, and also took language from the Portrait of a Graduate and incorporated it into the Portrait of a Learner. Um, part of that, the reasoning behind it was to expose the families and our kids to that language as early as possible. So they're seeing things like persevere and advocate and all of those um, working cooperatively and just that language. Um, but the other piece too is that now it's aligned K to five, it's the same standards every year um, in every grade level so that again, it, it leaves a nice little footprint for that full picture of portrait of a graduate, so starting in kindergarten going through year 12, um, but it also makes it really clear to parents what our expectations are K-12 in this, in this area. So this was kind of our way of connecting to what was happening 6 to 12 with the portrait of a graduate and creating our own portrait of a learner. We do not have a fancy graphic yet, but we'll work on it. Um, so the next slide here, one of the our goals for the presentation tonight was we really wanted to paint a full picture um, of all the data. So we wanted to just share a little bit about our report cards, which really are the primary form of communication for our parents. Um, and it also reflects a lot of the in-house measurement of our students' progress and growth. Um, so we're just talk a little bit about the elementary report card. So our report card is, is standard-based. It's on a four-point scale. Um, when you look there, what a one, two, three, for represents with three being highlighted because that's really where we want all of our kids to be. So three is that mastery, mastery or showing proficiency in the standard and really where we want to get all of our kids to. Um, noting that one thing that we are trying to get better at too is explaining that it's okay for kids to be a one or a two in the beginning of the year. That's okay. That's, that's kind of where we want them to be because our goal is to get them to that three or that four by the end of the year and recognizing that these really are year-long benchmarks. So we're looking for that growth throughout. Um, in all of our grade levels, we have grade level rubrics, which are used for these to really, again, keep that alignment on what's being assessed, how it's being assessed, and how that one, two, three, or four um, comes about for the report card in both math and ELA. This, when Jay asked, can we, can we put some examples of the report card on there, I was like, well, the elementary report card is pretty long because it is a standards-based report card. Um, so it's not having 85 slides instead of 76. Um, this just kind of breaks down the different domains or topics that kind of categories that are on the report card and you'll just see that alignment across all the grade levels and a little bit how it changes in the different grade levels and notice science and social studies in fourth and fifth grade but not in the lower grades but this just kind of breaks down the the general um, categories that are on the report card and then the next one it's a little hard to see but on your hopefully in your packets or when you see the presentation um, up close this is just an example of our report card which we were super excited about this year um, with our new system that we were using we were able to customize the report cards for all of our elementary schools so they all just the layout in general is much more friendly for parents and a little bit easier to digest um, and all the keys are line up and are in the right places but again this just shows you that progression from t1 to t3 all the standards are, are there for every trimester to just again show that growth in those standards throughout the throughout the three trimesters. And this is the report card for the middle school. Um, grading at LMS is a scaffolded approach to the grading model that they will then see at LHS. The grading is based on that traditional letter grade first. Uh, this letter grade is comprised of summative and formative assessments, where the summative assessments make up 80% of that total grade, and the formative assessments equate to 20% of the final grade. New this year um, for LMS, we began the process of basing our report card comments um, on our competency work. So when students receive their two comments per content course, they are based on that portion of a graduate and the uh, competencies. And then this is an example um, of a trimester report card. So this is like a trimester two for a student. It's a traditional view of the courses listed, term grades, and then those comments on the <coughs> side. Under the comments is where you find that competency-based comment that was derived this year from our curriculum instruction committee. So this came from the work of the staff and the teachers based on that portion of our graduate work. Uh, we compile our trimester grades to then celebrate our high honors, uh, honors and honorable mention students at the culmination of each trimester. 
So Mr. Perrin also asked us to share our report card, what it looks like, um, and then how our grades are determined. Uh, this is a newly designed report card to reflect the shift from a quarter-based grading system, which we've always been, to a semester-based approach. The semester grade is a violation of the course average and our semester end assessment. The semester is a success, uh, assessment, uh, which states the place of our final examinations, is an assessment not only of content knowledge, but the student's ability to apply what they have learned and demonstrate. This system is more aligned with our emphasis on competency-based learning and encourages students to truly learn the material presented rather than simply have a grade and just move on. Uh, if you look at our right side of the report card, we now have two comments, and those two comments are going to be discussed by Ms. Susie. On the next slide, what you see is the 9 to 12 grade report competency comments, and these comments have been revised to better reflect the skills that we want our students to possess. You will notice that these comments are aligned with our portrait of a graduate competencies, which include collaboration and communication, critical thinking, creativity and problem solving, self-direction, and engaged citizen. Also included are some more traditional comments, such as having to do with work completion, etc. So again, we've been presenting this data for a year and a half now and Dan long before that uh, seasonally and not referencing the main you know, focus and focal point to what students and, and parents are most familiar with, which were those report cards and the comments. So we wanted to include it this time around. We think it's an important uh, way of assessing our students because these are the teachers that see these kids every day and it really gets into the weeds of what they're seeing uh, in classrooms. That's not to say we can't go back and we should go back to our additional data collection tools. So the more traditional things that you're seeing from the former presentations are still included, which are iReady scores, um, Acadians and Dibbles, and our New Hampshire statewide assessment system, the New Hampshire SAS. And that's the collection tools we use uh, also when we're assessing our students. And now we're going to talk about the uh, K-5 to math and literacy data. Okay, so we're going to start with the kindergarten um, data. And just to go back to what Jay was referencing on the last slide, we will not be sharing SAS data today just because we don't have that yet. Um, but when we come back, we'll, that will be part of our presentation. But we wanted to make sure we still included those because it really hits those three major areas that we're um, getting our data from. So this is this slide reflects our kindergarten benchmark data um, that would actually be assessed on the report card. So unlike grades one to five, we do not have another math data point such as iReady for our kindergarten. So this highlights three standards and the number of students that, or the percentage of students that are meeting or exceeding the benchmark. So these would be actual items that are on the report card. Um, we're proud of these numbers and our kindergarten teachers and students. As you can see, these three standards reflect fundamental math mathematical skills for K that really lay a foundation for more of that complex mathematical concepts later um, later in grades. This next one is just a breakdown of trimester two. So this would be trimester two um, presented students who are meeting or exceeding math benchmarks. And you can see it laid out in the individual uh, benchmarks, so looking at counting objects, comparing numbers, um, addition, so this shows how many of those, that, or the percent of students that are meeting or exceeding. And just to kind of reference where it says CFAs there at the top, so CFAs are um, common informative assessments, but really the way that these are used at the kindergarten level, they're really used as more of a summative um, assessment to, to gather this data. So it's all the same assessment that's being used for these end and the trimester benchmarks. This next one compares um, trimester one to trimester two with those same benchmarks that you saw on the previous slide. So this just shows uh, the difference between T1 and T2. One thing I do want to point out, and as I mentioned before, those year-long benchmarks, so sometimes benchmark gets harder. Sometimes what's being asked of the students has increased, the expectation has changed. Um, so you might notice that there might be a little bit of a dip in some of those T2 um, percentages, but that's because really the bar has been raised a little bit. So again, the goal in being that we get back to that or continue to have that same goal of the percentage of kids as the benchmark rises. And this breakdown um, for kindergarten, so again, this is a comparison of T1 and T2, but this is all of the benchmarks combined. 
Um, so again, you'll see that a little slight increase from T1 to T2, which again, we're super proud of. Um, with our kindergarten teachers, they're implementing a full day math program into a half day setting, as we all know. Um, so to see, one, the increase from T1 to, to T2 overall, but really that steady percentage of over 80% of our kids that are meeting or exceeding at the kindergarten. All right, so this next slide, so we'll get into IRD data. You've seen this chart multiple times over the last few years. Um, so this one, so as we move into our first through fifth grade math data, we first want to share the growth from fall to winter um, and overall placement. So again, I'll point out that this is all four domains. Um, this slide shows the percent of students on or early on grade level, the growth in each grade level from fall to winter. Um, and then in the green column, you see that overall change or gains. Um, it's excellent growth to report out each of the grade levels. Uh, I do want to point out that you'll notice on the far right hand side, so that column, we grayed out those last three boxes for third, fourth, and fifth because this will be the last diagnostic that our third, fourth, and fifth graders take this year as we shift that focus to New Hampshire SAS. And if you remember when we came in the fall, we laid that plan out that we really <laughs> wanted to kind of play around with how we were assessing, when we were assessing, trying not to over assess our students. Um, so the goal is to have all of our third through fifth grade students taking the SAS, finding our way to kind of make the connection there and report that data out. With any student who does not take the SAS, they would then take the diagnostics so that we still have that information. Um, but we'll be able to come back and report out our first and second grade and what that growth looks like fall to, fall to spring. So this next, this next slide is actually a new data point that we wanted to share with you. And Megan's gonna share a very similar one, or the same exact one, but for the middle school. So I'll just kind of give you the background as to what it is, so she doesn't have to repeat that later. Um, so basically what you're seeing is the amount of students that were five points away or less from a scale score that would put them on early on grade level. Um, a student's assessment score is not based on the numbers of items that he or she answers correctly, but really it's determined by adjustments that are made after really every question that they answer. And what happens is the score is then determined using a model that considers the difficulty in the questions that they're given. Um, so the scale score is then compared to the iReady placement tables where that final placement of early on grade level, one grade level below, above grade level is then um, really given to the student. So we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into our data um, to see how many of our kids are sitting right there. Like how many are, are there? Because a lot of times when our teachers get the, their um, iReady reports and they're just seeing like, oh, here's their scale score. Here's their, they're on grade level. They're in the green, they're in the yellow. But we wanted to see how many kids are in the yellow but are just a few points away from bumping up to that early on grade level. Um, when we pulled this data in math, it was, it was a lot of kids. So we found that we were really, really excited that there were a lot of kids that were sitting, again, this is five or less. So some of these kids were sitting one point away from a scale score that would put them in the green. Um, so again, looking at this, just kind of recognizing that when you put those kids into this, this category really bumps up that total percentage of students that are, I mean, I think in teachers' eyes would consider that they're, they're on grade level. They really are, they're right there. Unfortunately, there's no way of us to know how many problems that is. Like, was it two problems in right, high ready? Was it one? Was it a geometry problem? What, what was it? You really would have to dig a little bit deeper into, um, into their different domains and whatnot, but there's no way of knowing Oh, it's two problems wrong. That's what, you know, that's how many points equates to this. So, um, but we were really excited when we saw this and wanted to share out. Um, and again, I think painting that whole picture and also I think this painted a different picture for our teachers too. And they were able to really see like, oh, how many of my kids are just are right there and so close. So again, we wanted to bring up the national and the uh, New Hampshire scores and how we compared to them. And once again, London Dairy, uh, outpaces uh, the national and state average in all five grades. Um, while we're still not where we want to be, you're going to notice significant growth in our, our first graders from where they were in the fall, and really across grades one through five. Uh, we have gains of 14 to 18, per, uh, excuse me, 14 to 28 percent over the national average, and 6 percent to 25 percent gains over the New Hampshire average. And if you 
you know, look at grade three in particular, it's very impressive. Um, as Nicole mentioned, for the spring, grades one and two will continue to take um, the iReady, but grades three through five will really shift their focus just on the New Hampshire SAS. Good, so I just want to take this opportunity to praise a lot of people. Uh, we were all there when we started the year where the goal was, can we move our numbers? Um, and I think, be besides what Nicole just showed, where in math at least we have this pretty large cusp of kids who are almost there. Can we, get, can we push them over the goal line? Um, but what this chart shows is that I think is really promising uh, practices. So we we're actually comparing, uh, except for first grade, first grade is a little different. Like if, if you see the, the second grade column right there, we're comparing them as first graders to where they were as second graders. So, um, and the same thing goes all the way through, through <coughs> second grade. So what this chart is, chart is showing us is South School as a school moved 7% of their kids. It took 7% kids who were below grade level and got them on grade level as an entire school. Um, first grade's an average, so South School first grade is doing better than last year. But when you start to look at it kind of the other grades, the second grade team moved 14% of their kids. And I was heading into this year hoping like, okay, we've had this math program for three years. We should be able to hopefully see some growth, some performance and moving our numbers. I was hopeful we can get that a, a 10 point growth out of math. South School's already done it in, in the second grade team. Look at their third grade team. They moved them by 15 points. They've already done it. Can they keep it going uh, through the spring? We sure hope so. Uh, I was down there in a staff meeting kind of praising them. Um, but then the real key uh, when we look at South School is if you remember we've gone over this again and again, we see a lot of growth K to three, then it's keeping up with those much harder standards four to eight where we, we are challenged by. Look at the growth that South School put into place for fourth grade, up five points, they're halfway there. Fifth grade, up 10 points. That is not normally our pattern. Uh, so Deb's challenge with her team is, what are some of the things you guys have done differently that we can then reproduce around the district? But there's other good news. Uh, look at Matthew Thornton in second grade. They moved them by nine points. Or Matthew, Ford, third in, Matthew Thornton in third grade. They moved them by four points. Or I go Matthew Thornton in fourth grade, 16 point jump. That's a big, big jump. You know, that's a, that's a big movement. So they have moved the numbers. Uh, then we get to North School in third grade. They also moved their third grade by seven points. And then also look at the middle school, five point jump for, the, for middle school in math. So th this is the work we need to do, and it was really promising to see it so early. Um, obviously, we can do this again, go spring to spring. Yeah. Um, but these are the type of things we're kind of looking for, and we'll do this again in reading. Thank you. Okay. Um, so as we mentioned before, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the data and paint a bigger picture for you, um, as well as share more stories of student growth. Uh, this slide is a nice picture of growth for each grade level. Um, students are given, so after their diagnostic, students are given a typical growth and a stretch growth based off of their first diagnostic performance. This slide shows the percentage of students in each grade level who have already met their typical growth for end of year as well as their stretch growth for the end of the year, um, just at their winter benchmark. Uh, we also have a large percentage of students at each grade level who have met at least 50% of their typical or their stretch. Um, which again shows that we're on track for meeting those end of year goals. Um, the last column on the right shows the amount of our students or the percentage of students who improve placement. So these students may have been one grade level below and are now early on grade level or early on grade level and are now above grade level. Um, and to just, I know it's written there for you, but just to um, give a little information on that. So the typical growth is really like that average annual growth that you kind of like hope and expect to see, where the stretch growth is more of that, if you have a student who's placed below grade level, we're really trying to stretch them to proficiency. If you have a student who's on grade level, we're really trying to stretch them to that, that above grade level performance. So again, we have resources and opportunities to reinforce the efforts we have in place to continue to make significant gains uh, in mathematics. Um, and again, they include our best practices that I already um, provides us with, Summit Math Academy, um, the 30 minutes of additional math time, um, and then again, working uh, across uh, district level math teams for pacing and, and alignment and refinement of some curriculum assessments there. Um, we're, we're really targeting uh, areas where we can uh, have students have more exposure to problem solving, critical thinking, reasoning, 
um, and our STEM uh, groups and classes are, are doing great with that. So a lot of targeted efforts in place there to continue to, to move the numbers. Now we'll shift to the reading. <laughs> Okay, so again, the first slide will start with kindergarten. Um, so this slide actually shows two benchmark data points that are assessed and shared on the report card. And then also the um, third one is this information actually came from Acadians or Dibbles, which is our screener that um, we'll reference again later on in the presentation. Uh, but if you remember, I believe it was in the fall that we came and just kind of highlighted like what Acadians is and just kind of um, intro that to you. Um, so again, this highlights um, uh, the number of kids who are meeting or exceeding benchmark in trimester two. Um, and for this, uh, to go back to why these three, these are really some of those foundational skills that our students need to become readers, writers, and um, to, to increase that language development. This is a breakdown of, again, of all of the kindergarten CFAs and the different uh, domains there that uh, the benchmarks on the report card. Again, these would be reported out there. So these are our students that are meeting or exceeding those benchmark levels here in uh, trimester two. And then again, this is an example of that trimester one to trimester two comparison. And I just want to point out again to you that um, sometimes the benchmark's changing. So that, that target is increasing. The expectations are getting a little bit higher. And the kindergarten team did a, a lot of work around their rubrics um, recently with really kind of targeting what that looks like. So again, you might see something um, like lowercase letters, the amount of letters that they need to be able to, to recognize or to be able to print is gonna change as the trimester goes on. So that, that benchmark has increased a little bit. This that now shows the comparison of T1 to T2, just overall benchmarks. You notice there's a little bit of a dip there, but again, what we're asking these kids to do is, is progressively getting a little bit harder. Um, but overall, really happy with the over 80% of our kids uh, meter, meeting or exceeding, um, especially just in year two of um, foundations implementation for kindergarten. Okay, so this will be the same as the math with showing the fall to winter to spring, um, or what will be spring gains for reading. Um, I think just to highlight here again, our growth is pretty similar, and I, I think we should note that we still see that little bit of a dip going from third to fourth grade, and just recognizing that that's, this is the time where our kids are going from learning to read to reading to learn. Um, I think we've presented on that a lot in the last couple years with, and, and just this year in general with our literacy pilot and our goals around implementing a program that we, um, and some resources that we really hope will start to make that shift and from third to fourth grade, so we're supporting those kids with that, that big change there. Um, but still really happy with the growth here. Um, and just again to point out that, that great out column that we'll have in the intersaf data to share for third through fifth grade. Okay, so this one is the same. This slide will show the same um, scenario that we gave earlier with those kids that are sitting just in the yellow. Um, when we pulled the reading data, it, as you can see, it's we weren't quite as excited about the math. The math, there was a ton of kids that were sitting there reading. There wasn't quite, it wasn't quite the same. Um, we've been kind of like coming up with our own theories as to why that might be the case. Um, I think some of it is around to, to Jay's point, to Dan's point earlier, we, our math and focus ad adoption, we've been using math and focus for a longer period of time. So we've really had that systemic resource and consistent aligned resource um, within our, all of our grades, K to five. Um, our other theory is that reading skills are really not done in isolation. So this might be a case where students aren't necessarily seeing like a new reading scale in a question, but rather the text complexity is getting harder or that application piece is getting a little bit more difficult. Um, whereas in math, they may be seeing more of like an isolated skill within a domain. So those are just our theories as to why this might look the way that it does. Um, but definitely something that we'll continue to dig into and keep an eye on and see if, if that's a trend. Um, and see if we can find other reasons as to that. But still, I mean, there's still kids that are sitting in each grade level that are, again, just that little bit below being in the green. 
So again, we're including, including the national and New Hampshire uh, data points to compare to Lundair's performance. And uh, we, again, outpace uh, those averages in all five grades. Um, it's a significant <coughs> growth in first, second, and third graders from where they were in the fall. And again, across grades one through five. Uh, we have gains of 14 to 28 percent over the national average and 9 to 21 percent gains over the New Hampshire average. Um, and again, we're very proud of them looking at uh, grade three, all of them did well by grade three in particular. Uh, they've already met their goals of being proficient in the 80th percentile of what we were looking for to begin with uh, in the winter, a full season really ahead of schedule. So uh, we want that for our other grades in, in the future. And then again, here's this cohort to cohort look. So, you know, if, if the goal this year is can we get that 10 point growth in math, it was a little bit more arbitrary with reading. We're not doing things dramatically different. We have all this phonics work uh, we're doing, but we, we definitely know we have to implement a literacy program. But uh, I was hoping, hey, can we get a five point jump? We have a lot of examples. Uh, so, again, South School as a whole school got a six point jump. Great job, South School. Um, and some of it was in first grade where they got a 16 point jump from last year's first grade. Or for second grade, they got a 20 point jump over the prior year. Or third grade was a nine point jump. We do see that dip in fourth and fifth grade and that really points us to that's why we need the new systemic reading program. Hope, I think they're coming here on May 7th, ready to make the recommendation of what we want to purchase. So that's exciting. Um, but there's other good news. Um, Matthew Thornton overall had a 3% jump. You know, that's almost there to that five. Can they keep it up to get that five point growth by the spring? Big jump in second grade. So they took a group of first graders and moved 27% of them more to on grade level. Wonderful work, winter to winter. And then 11% jump in third grade. And then we get to, to North School, 5% uh, jump in first grade. Another huge jump, 22 in second grade. 10% uh, in third grade. And then, you know, the one shining star above third grade is sixth grade at the middle school. Like, that was a great thing. They took a group of fifth graders, they moved them up by five points. Those are the things we want to see. So that was really, really good work. And I think we wanted to highlight that. And hopefully, we can come back with all the spring and have that same kind of view and see if, how close we met some of those benchmarks. So this is the same slide from the math section of the presentation, just celebrating that, that individual student growth, or uh, obviously we're bumping them into grade levels here, but I think to just point out, again with this, with that typical instruct growth, this is a lot of what our teachers are looking at, and a lot of what our parents are looking at. When we're talking to parents and we're having data chats with their kids before the diagnostic, this is really what they're focused on, is, is that individual growth and getting to that typical growth or getting to that stretch growth. So again, this is end of year growth that we've already Seen. These students have already met that at the winter benchmark um, with, again, when I pulled the, the rest of the data, there's a whole another group of kids that have met are already at about 50% of that growth. So we anticipate they will also reach that by the end of the year. Um, and then to the, to the right, again, that improved placement, which I didn't really point out on the math slide too, but we were pretty close to 50% in all of, or above in all of our grade levels of kids that have improved that placement. Um, in both math and reading. So this is some reading intervention data. Um, so this slide not only shows the tremendous growth our reading intervention students have made, but also the more fluid approach to using data our reading specialists have adopted. In years past, students were rarely discharged from reading intervention, and this year, after some new training and professional development, our reading teachers have been looking at data in different ways, utilizing new data and analyzing the data regularly with the goal of getting students back into the classroom. Um, as you can see at this point in the year, each of the three elementary schools have discharged students, celebrating their return to the classroom and that tier one instruction. Um, the other piece that's here, as you can see, and again, these are just our intervention students or students that are going to see our reading specialists or reading teachers at some point in their day um, or receiving reading services. This is the breakdown of their kiddos that have met um, either their, their stretch growth for the middle of the year, their typical growth for the middle of the year, or some of them gave their end of year as well. So again, these are, this is pretty exciting. Um, and I think all of the reading specialists were really proud to share, like look how many kids are going back into the classroom and they feel really good about that. All right, so some exciting um, success stories to share from Moussel as well. So this slide shows reading the reading composite score data from Acadians, or again, our online screener or Dibbles assessment. 
Um, this shows the growth in K from winter of last year to winter of this year. Um, so if you remember from the original presentation when we were talking about Acadians, we can't really come with like, here's the fall and here's the winter, because what's happening in Acadians, one, they might be taking a different subtest, so it can't really be compared apples to apples in the reading deposit score, the weight of it, there's a lot of different things that go into that. But what we can share is, here are our kindergartners last year um, with this screener, and the percentage of kiddos that are either exceeding needs, and then again, I think on the other side, looking at the kiddos that fall in intensive or strategic, and here's what it looks like this year, and there was a lot of growth that happened um, from winter of last year to winter of this year. So again, I think this really goes to show the hard work that our kindergarten teachers are putting into um, to getting their kids and, and moving them forward. This one shows the same, so winter of last year to winter of this year, or that mid-year benchmark for phoneme segmentation. Um, so again, this is when our kiddos are breaking words into individual sounds. Um, so if you remember, we, um, again, we've highlighted the percentage of students meeting the overall uh, reading deposit score. Again, this is just for this one subtest. Um, and this one is not given at the beginning of the year, so this is something we couldn't show fall to winter anyway. The first time they see it is in the winter, but if you look at the jump from last winter to this winter, and again, I think if you look not just at the green, but if you look at where the red and the yellow have gone as well, which obviously goes hand in hand, but I think just noticing that decrease of the students that are falling into those categories. And same thing, this one shows nonsense word fluency. Um, so this is basically like made up words that follow um, phonetic patterns that students are given and they need to give the correct letter sound in those words. Um, and again, this is showing winter last year to, to winter this year, which is a huge jump in our students that are meeting that, that benchmark. Um, so again, no, I was just gonna say, again, I think all three of those slides, that, that growth in kindergarten just we're in second, our second year of implementing foundations at the kindergarten level. They've done an amazing job at fitting a full day program or curriculum into a half day. Um, and I think we said it in the fall as well, but what we're hearing from our first grade teams consistently in PLCs and consistently when they're looking at their data is that those, our kindergarten students are coming in more prepared and um, especially in you know, the foundational skills. So that's really exciting to see. So these resources and opportunities reinforce the efforts that are in place again in reading um, with our staff getting all uh, letters trained. Um, the uh, second year of the foundation's implementation, as Nicole mentioned, to the use of Hegarty resources, Battle of the Books. Um, our district literacy committee, phenomenal job, and we're really excited to, to bring uh, our recommendation for a literacy program to our district in the coming, uh, coming school board meetings, coming weeks. Um, where we have some focus areas, and then again, that, that pilot was tremendously successful. So I think we're making really, really great gains. Um, within those initiatives, as we mentioned, targeting 20% of the students just below grade level in each classroom. So there's some targeted interventions there with our teachers, using the PLC data <coughs> to uh, create some deliverables around iReady and Acadian's performance tasks. Um, more exposure to the SAS test, that's where it's across the states. So we really want to know every single student in the state's taking that, as opposed to some of the already um, diagnostic tools. And then a, a narrow focus, so we're taking some of those assessments away so that they're not, we're not so overloading them with, with, uh, with these assessments. And then these are our conclusions and next steps, um, as I already mentioned. Now on to LMS. That's a lot of data that we threw at you. I don't know if there's any. In fairness, we have four schools. We, we do. That's true. That's true. Nicole so already we, laid the foundation. She so certainly did. All right. So we're going we're gonna to continue unless there were any pressing questions. Are you okay right now? That I was moved to the middle school, or did you have anything? Perfect. Good. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So we're oh, So again, same same collection tools that we're using. I ready. Uh, PSAT 8, that those 8th graders, it's the first time they get exposed to the practice test or the SAT, the SAS, and then we're really excited about the accelerated pathways our students have. All right, so um, this slide depicts our iReady data for math for the 2023-2024 uh, school year. Students have made great progress in the area of math um, from our fall to winter, and we're really um, 
excited about some of these games. Um, again, like Tim pointed out, especially in our sixth grade. Our students in sixth grade have made that 20% gain, 15%, seven, and 5% in eight. But it's important to note that this assessment, again, covering all four domains, um, but that benchmark continues to increase. The expectations become more rigorous and more difficult. Um, so it's more challenging as they move through. And again, when you get up to middle school math, it becomes really challenging. Um, so we're really proud of that information that we are now receiving. Um, this is that same slide, again, that Nicole talked to you about. Um, that it's really interesting when you start really breaking down that data and looking at the cusp kids that we're calling them and when teachers are really focused on how do I move those kids. Now it's just you know really finding out how do we drill down that data just a little bit better so that we can provide interventions and resources for them. Um, but this is that cohort of students who are on grade level and early on grade level from that winter diagnostic coupled with that second column who are just five points or less away from that early on grade level placement. And again, it's really excited to see that you know we're up in the 60s, 70s, 80% um, in that math category. So again, we'll take the national and state comparisons. Um, and we have gains of 10 to 27% over the national average and 6 to 25% gains over the New Hampshire average. Really proud of the work, as Dan mentioned, in grade 6 in particular. Uh, and once again, for the spring, grade 6 will through A will focus on the New Hampshire SAS. So this is our celebration of growth, and LMS has really taken on that as a true focus this year. Um, when our teachers are meeting and having conferences with students, this is the information that they're talking about. Where are you on your typical growth range? Where are you in your stretch growth, and have you met that? And we're actually celebrating that um, with incentives and raffles, and there's all kinds of fun things that happen on team with that. Um, I already breaks that growth model into typical growth and stretch growth. Uh, the typical growth is that average annual growth for students in placement level, and the stretch growth is recommended for students who place below grade level on that path to proficiency. This um, is our information, again, um, really just focused on, you know, where are our students in relation to where they started? Are they growing in our classrooms? Are we doing the right things? Are, are they learning and are they growing as middle schoolers? And they really are, and again, it's really exciting to see, and this is the stuff that our teachers are talking to their kids about all the time. Uh, we have a lot of resources and opportunities that are happening in math. Um, again, that focus for math and focus, Q to 8, I think we're really starting to kind of see the, the fruits of that labor and all of the work that's going into all of this all the time. We do have one part-time math interventionist, and she is pulling kids and working with that group that is in that custody range that we talked about. Um, we have summer school for remediation for our students that are going to need it. Um, again, some pre-algebra programs happening. And just this whole building focus on growth. So right before our diagnostic and after, sitting down and talking with their kids about where you are, what do you want to do, how do you set goals, and what do you need to do to become a, a, a goal-set-minded student or a growth mindset. Um, and that's really that growth model that we're focused on. We will shift now to our reading data. And slide um, <laughs> This slide depicts our iReady reading data for, again, this school year. And we've made progress in that area of reading from fall to winter. Our students have made 11% gains in our sixth grade. That's seven, uh, in seventh grade, 6%. And in eighth grade, only 2%. But again, the information, the passages become more difficult. They're longer, they're more challenging, and um, our eighth graders, you know, take a little bit to be incentivized to get them to kind of buy into this. It's a lot of work for them, um, especially if they've taken the PSAT and those other assessments. So we're really working on, um, you know, that growth mindset with those kiddos. This is that cohort of students, again, who are sitting in that little cuspy range of early on grade level. and. You know, what could we do to take that information um, and provide them some resources and some um, intervention time to really move that number? And again, um, you know, seeing our students in that 60s, almost 70% is um, really exciting. And I know it's, you know, it's not as much as our, our math, but you can definitely see the hard work that's being put in every day. Our students are sitting in reading classes. They are reading. They um, have a separate class in 6th and 7th grade. 
um, to really focus on those skills and really grow that um, student profile. Uh, again, national and state comparison. Um, we have gains of 15 to 27 percent over the national average and 4 percent to 22 percent gains over the New Hampshire average. Again, looking at grade 6 in particular. Um, so really proud of, of their work and they're trending in the right direction. This is back both slides. So with our focus on celebrating our growth, teams were able to offer incentives for students who met their typical and stretch growth. This provided many fun opportunities in the forms of raffles, incentives to believe in the power of that growth model and that mindset for our students. Um, I already breaks that growth model into those typical um, <coughs> growth right on the reports for the students um, and the teachers to have that student-led conference. Um, and this data shows our fall to winter growth. Again, um, you know, really making some, some good gains there. Um, and really moving that improved placement. When 47% of them are moving grade placement levels, you know, that's something to really be excited about. And we have lots of opportunities um, for literacy at the middle school. So again, in grades six and seven, they take an English class, but they also take a reading class with a specific focus on the um, reading standards. Um, this gives them a lot of time to you know, work on encompassing um, all those standards that are involved in their content level courses as well. The intervention courses that we have are Read 180 in grades six and seven. We also do offer a reading skills class for eighth grade. Um, summer school is offered for students who need remediation in reading and or English class. And our storm time, that 30 minute block of time at the end of our day, provides really good opportunity for what students need during that time. So sometimes it's just time for independent reading to practice that skill of reading. Sometimes it's to work with teachers specifically, to work on remediation activities. Um, but it's really a focused um, approach to um, what our students need during that time. Um, and LMS also took a focused approach on reading nonfiction. So one of the goals was how can you read nonfiction reading in all content areas, in your music class? How do you read it in your science class? How do you read it in PE with health articles? All kinds of different places. So that practice of you know, really trying to improve that nonfiction reading skill. So through our focused approach, LMS is again focusing on student data. Um, with focused weekly PLC meetings, teachers are able to compare and discuss data regularly. This also provides opportunities to dive into specifics around students' need for re remediation and or enrichment. Professional development this year has spent um, a lot of time looking at student data and focusing on the transitions with specific conversations from the fifth to sixth grade and from our eighth grade to ninth grade. So getting our teachers together and having those conversations of what are our expectations when students come to LMS from the elementary school, you know, so that we're having that real cohesive conversation. And again, same for the eighth to ninth grade. What are you expecting when we send our ninth graders to the high school? Um, and are really having that open, honest conversation. And it's been um, really exciting, I think, for our teachers this year. Um, and then with the shift in our testing calendar, we can now provide opportunities for practice um, with our New Hampshire SAS assessment and then other assessments um, that they're going to actually get um, credit for at LHS as well. So this is our PSAT data. And we did present this information um, in our last presentation, so I just wanted to give an overview. But I don't think we ever got to highlight, which is our next slide, which was our top six score. So out of a 1440, we had um, you know, a student, our top score is a 1240. That's a, a really exciting number to see for a student first time ever taking the PSAT. Um, and it is a very challenging assessment. So this practice, I think, is really um, helping our students just get exposure to how to take an assessment like this. It's the same for our New Hampshire SAS. It's that practices, how do you take this type of assessment? And that's a lot of the work that just needs to um, be brought to their attention. And here are some of our really exciting enrichment opportunities at LMS. So um, again, I just broke them down into content areas, and I'm going to talk about two specifically. There have been no changes in um, math. Again, we offer our advanced math 6, advanced math 7, pre-algebra, CP algebra 1, and honors algebra. In math, um, CP algebra 1 and honors algebra for LHS credit. 
in reading, we do offer high reading at our sixth grade and advanced reading at seventh grade. There is no advanced reading offering for eighth grade because most of our students do not take reading in eighth grade as an advanced um, opportunity. They take a world language. As you can see, we have our CP Spanish 1, CP French 1 under world language, and next year we're really excited to bring over um, German, so to offer students another opportunity uh, one period a day. And then for the first time ever, very exciting for us, uh, we are going to offer a um, enrichment for Earth and Space, so a high school-based class for eighth graders uh, for the Earth and Space class. So we have that Science 8 class, but again, this uh, pathway for a celebration of um, science as well. So some really cool opportunities that are gonna, going to be coming to the middle school for next year, two, two specifically that we're really excited about. Um, and these are just some T2 numbers, since it's always great to be able to celebrate um, kids that are working hard every single day, not just that single uh, one day assessment, but the kids who are working hard every day. And here are a T2 high honors, honors, and honorable mention um, number of students that are in those categories. And it's really great to see um, the hard work that these kids are putting in every day. And really, it's a third to half of them are making the honor roll in some form. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So as, uh, as we conclude the middle school portion of the data, it's important to wrap up with a continued focus on providing rigorous learning environment with a focused approach to learning and a commitment to excellence. Um, we feel we provide an appropriate scaffolded approach to prepare students um, beyond LMS, which is the next presentation. presentation. Um, our students will begin to see choice in our course offerings in related arts next year, as well as accelerated pathways, and they can then thrive in an environment with opportunity for all learners. So we're really excited about the work that's happening. Okay, now we'll turn this decision to LHS. So, um, as we explore our high school's academic achievements and student successes, it's crucial that we examine some key markers of progress. So over the last three years, we've closely tracked our graduation rates. We've had impact on dual enrollment courses. We've had student performances in the AP courses that we offer. And there are scores on standardized exams, such as the PSAT and SAT. Um, additionally, we take pride in recognizing our students' academic achievement with honors, such as uh, the JS Limo Award, accolades for our scholar athletes, and accommodations for those who consistently meet high standards to our honorable status. Uh, this presentation will show you the dedication to academic excellence and the development of our student body. So as you see, the, uh, the graduation rate of London High School remains strong. Over the past three years, our high school has consistently remained uh, uh, at the top with an excellent graduation rate with fewer than 1% of students dropping out of LHS. Through the support system, rigorous academic programs, and nurturing community, we have ensured that nearly every student who enters our halls emerges with a diploma in their hands. Uh, this consistent graduation rate not only reflects the effectiveness of our educational approach, but speaks volumes about the commitment and resilience of our students, faculty, and our support staff in trying to strive for excellence. So the New Hampshire University and Manchester Community, Co community College have established, as you know, a collaborative partnership with Londonderry High School instructors who are in the designation of adjunct faculty, enabling our students to kickstart their college journey while still in high school. For a minimal fee of $100, a three credit course from SNU, or $100 through Manchester Community College, students can earn three college credits while they're still within the halls of LHS. Through a state-funded grant, students also can take their first two courses through Manchester Community College in the STEM field for free. These provide not only the students for academic rigor, but also help students when they're applying for college admissions, having been able to say that they have already earned credit, or in many cases, being able to graduate early or start grad school even early when they head off to undergrad. This initiative offers students a head start in their journey and offers a diverse range of courses that students can explore various academic disciplines as part of this initiative, thereby giving them some ideas before they head off to college and helping them potentially choose a major that will be something that they will truly enjoy and they will find beneficial. The Advanced Placement Program offers rigorous and challenging academic opportunities, inviting students to engage in additional college-level courses. 
The program boasts an opportunity to participate in pursuit collegiate level studies, successful performance on the respective AP examination grants students advanced placement or credit, fostering their academic advancement. To eliminate the financial hurdles, as we mentioned earlier this year, $46,000 in grant funding was secured by our assistant superintendent to cover the cost of all AP exams this May. Without the financial barrier of $100 to take the class, students can now challenge themselves to take the examination. As the chart shows, the number of students taking the AP examination, or in the case of arts, many a portfolio, has increased significantly when the financial barrier was removed. During the 24-25 school year, again, students will not be required to pay themselves for the course, and all students taking an AP course will be taking that company exam in May. So, all juniors are required to take the SAT with essay, as this is our state assessment for English and Mathematics. In anticipation for the standardized test, which more colleges are returning to requiring as part of the application procedure, all students in freshman, sophomore, and junior years take the PSAT. This is an opportunity for them to practice the type of assessment administered by the College Board. This fall was the first time the College Board utilized the Blue Book application. Administering the test at 7.20 in the morning, we realized that there was a little problem with the application. Um, this disproportionately affected the, almost the entire East Coast, uh, but it was rectified within the two hours. However, the disruption did cause much difficulty for our students, and there were questions as to whether we should continue, whether we should sign out, sign back in, or even end the test. Uh, although we're not happy with these scores, uh, we do see an avenue to, uh, to improve student achievement and investigate. Um, academic achievement is a large part of our culture at LHS. Students re receive recognition for excellence in various subject areas. This particular one, which will be recognized again at our uh, pep rally on Friday, uh, the J.S. Lima is an Emmy of winning, award winning professor at MIT who felt in a global marketplace, mathematics and science skills are critical for our next generation. Therefore, he created this J.S. Lim Foundation which helps U.S. students reach their full potential in areas of math and science. In 2014, the J.S. Lim Foundation asked Londonderry High School to be the first school in New Hampshire to award the top mathematics and top science prizes to members of our junior class. This year will be our 10th year to award the prize of $1,000 to each student. And next year's prize, we've been lucky enough that they've contacted us, and next year there will be $1,500 for each of the two students. Each year, Londonderry High School seniors are recognized in Concord, New Hampshire as scholar athletes. Criteria for this award include at least one of the following, a minimum of a B plus average, be ranked in the top 25% of their class, and achieve a score on the SAT of at least 1100. The applicant must also have earned at least one varsity letter in each of the past two years. They also must complete an application, have a letter of recommendation from the high school athletic director. Moving on to honor roll. To be eligible for the honor roll at the high school, a student must have earned a 3.2 to 3.6 semester grade point average and maintain a semester transcript with grades of C minus or higher. High honor roll status is achieved with a 3.7 semester grade point average or higher and a semester transcript with grades of, with grades of C minus or higher. Honor roll and high honor roll pins depicting the lamp of knowledge, a symbol of the eternal flame will be available throughout the semester for students. Students pick them up during their lunch periods and students were who were, did not remember to pick them up during their lunch, their house offices track them down to give them their pins. This is part of a whole new procedure we have where we are recognizing academic excellence with these pins that will be used in, actually Mr. Coyne will talk about the Chanel letter. So I'll let that. <laughs> So the Future Lab at LHS provides a physical and virtual space where students can explore trades and various career paths. Um, at LHS, all students engage in fulfilling college and career-ready goals, utilizing resources like Khan Academy and Road Trip Nation to prepare for their future pathways. Uh, in the spring, events included career breakfasts focused on amazing careers, no college necessary, and careers in the food industry. Career snapshot presentations have focused on careers in the sciences and legal profession. Each of these presentations offered the range of potential careers in those fields, those requiring training and apprenticeships, two-year degrees, 
or a college education. The Spring Career Fair, Fair brought in various branches of the military as well as employers, including celebrations, distinctive catering, Home Depot, Empire Beauty School, All American Assisted Living, Living, and the TSA, which hiring for summer jobs and internships. The Future Lab uh, joined with our school counseling department to sponsor the first What's Next Fair, which brought in various vendors and social service agencies offering employment opportunities as well as companies such as Finnegan Fence, a local fence company owned by Londonderry High School graduates, which discussed a range of entry-level positions. Also in attendance were post-secondary educational opportunities from programs such as Manchester Community College, Mitchell College, and UNH 4U programs designed for students seeking a non-traditional post-secondary path. More than 57 families attended this event and expressed their appreciation for the exposure to opportunities that they didn't even know existed for their students. And then, uh, we are excited about this. This is something new for us, but LHS is making a concerted effort to recognize students for their academic and co-curricular achievements. Each incoming first year student is given a shamiho, letter L. Um, over the course of their high school career, they'll have the opportunity to earn recognition pins for honor roll and co-curricular involvement. Co-curricular in, uh, includes uh, clubs, music, and uh, co-curricular and athletics. The number of individuals, participants in at least one activity, and this, these are great numbers here, is 1,042 students of our student body of 1,270, which is 82% participation rate from our student body. Um, a quick shout out um, to our eSports team for capturing the first state championship for eSports as recognized by the NHIA this weekend. Um, uh, they, uh, they won actually not one state title, they won two state titles, uh, both on Saturday and sun uh, on Sunday um, for their e-game. Pretty exciting. Uh, students will be encouraged to place their pins on their letter L ultimately having upon graduation a memento that serves a, purport, uh, like a portfolio for their involvement here at LHS. And looking at conclusions and next steps for London Air High School, we are actively focused on improving standardized testing scores, aiming to elevate student achievement. Through diverse pathways, students can earn college credits, experiencing college level rigor within LHS's supportive environment. And additionally, LHS prioritizes preparing students for their post-graduation endeavors whether it be college, entering the workforce, joining the military, or taking a gap year, facilitated by the Futures Lab and School Counseling Department. So as you can tell, we took a deep dive. Thank you for <laughs> indulging us here. Uh, we'll make a pivot in the spring to break this up a little bit, because we've been at this for the better part of an hour. But we're excited about this. We're excited about our students' accomplishments. We know there's work to be done. Um, but again, we're proud of the work that our staff has engaged in, our principals have led, our curriculum uh, coordinators have been fabulous in, in coordinating a lot of this and analyzing it and bringing back best practice to our staff. They've been phenomenal. So again, I, I'm just uh, so thankful to be part of such a, a, a wonderful team here. And I think we're doing a lot of good work in Londonderry and we're gonna keep, keep pushing. We welcome any questions or comments from the board. One thing I'd like to see like to promote this a little more for all our hard work yeah. and get this out to our community, what well, we're doing inside the walls of these buildings for all your efforts, starting you know with the superintendent and all you folks, you know, should be commended. You know, there's been challenges out there for many years and we are moving that, you know, of the efforts inside these buildings. So I think this needs to be expressed to the community. Um, as many ways as we can yep. to show them how hard um, we are trying to give our students as much possible you know and growth mm -hmm. in in the education everybody is doom and gloom you know that grade scores throughout the state the country are low yep. and I, I think with the efforts of the entire staff you guys are trying to to move that mm -hmm. forward and you should be commended for that and I think the community really needs to see that and I think the parents would appreciate it I think the students would appreciate it because they're the other ones ultimately doing the work so I, I think if we can do this in segments yeah. for elementary for kindergarten for 
middle school for high school um, and then the potential with the dual enrollment going through the roof yeah you know and and some of these percentages that you, you know yourself said at the opening mm -hmm. week of school mm -hmm. um, staff has taken that and you know excelled even higher yeah. so that's what it's about is the students getting that and the staff really you know moving everything forward so thank you so much and if we can promote this a little bit you know through local papers yes. through our blog whatever we can do I think I think it it'll people in the state will see something here yeah you know for sure so I appreciate it thank, thank you, you so much thank you. To community input on strategic plan, Mr. Black. Yeah, just you know, basically, um, you know, we're going internally right now to kind of surface from our staff what are our priorities. So I think we want to use hopefully our, our May school board meetings and some of our June school board meetings. The public has priorities. I think we should focus on. It. It's a great time. Uh, if we get no one to speak up, you know, we can think of other tools over the summer to kind of gather uh, feedback. But I think we'll, we'll throw it out there. We'll put something out on the blog once we get back from break, just to let everyone know. If there are priorities you kind of have, um, come and speak up. Yeah. Along with the school board, obviously, we're doing sure. work. Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, 5.3, the uh, forum we have coming up tomorrow night, right? Yes, we have two. Um, so tomorrow at uh, 4 o'clock at Moose Hill, we can come in person. There's a bullying forum. It's more geared towards elementary schools. Um, the general idea is being able to understand the difference between peer conflict, maybe when it does become bullying, what that investigation process looks like. So it's it's a collaboration between counselors and the administration. Um, so that's tomorrow. We're gonna put it on Facebook Live so people can ask questions online. Uh, we'll YouTube it um, so that people can access it at any point in time. And then on May 15th to 315, the middle school, high school version of it will show up. Because the conversation looks too different um, at, at those two levels. Yep. So, so that's gonna be coming uh, soon too. Uh, that'll be at the middle school library at 315 on May 15th, but similar format. Here's peer conflict, here's what bullying looks like, here's what the investigation process looks like, and you have the, kind of the experts, our assistant principals and counselors kind of walking us through it. And you'll have people be able to ask questions at both yep. of these, yep. and, um, and if they have further questions, they could send them in yep. Google form or sure. something to that yeah. effect yeah. To, to have an answer. They, they can come live and ask questions. Sure. Or they can do it through Facebook. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, three. you said 315, the second one, and 4 o'clock tomorrow. Yep. It might be a problem for yep. some parents. Yep. Yep. So if we have a way that they could send in some questions sure. um, just to add to that, Dan, I think it might be helpful to the community. Yep. And tomorrow night's forum is also at the middle school. No, tomorrow's at Muso. 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 I'll open up public comment. If anyone has anything, <laughs> Mr. Wilson, anything? <laughs> well, I guess speaking for the great grandparents in town, sure. I'm <clears throat> impressed, and I don't get impressed very easily. I thought it was a great presentation tonight, and we've come, what I perceive to be quite a ways pretty quickly. And clearly, everything seems to be going. The only comment, uh, first of all, I thought that was an excellent package. Uh, just an excellent package put together. It was long, it's all uh, got it. And uh, there's a lot, a lot of questions here. One, one suggestion I would make, I think it's time on some of those slides when you put them together, is put numbers in, in, in place of some of the, no, in addition to the percentages. And I say that because I'm actually thinking now about what that top, what the goal ought to be. And, you know, when I look at some of the numbers, I say, geez, if we can get to 50, you know, 85% or so on, that's pretty good. But once you start putting numbers on what that 15% really represents, sometimes you come back and say, you know, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. So I think on some of the schedules showing what the realities of what, you know, You'll see the good numbers, but what, what those bad numbers that we still haven't got there yet really means in terms of how many kids yep. are in you know jeopardy one way or the other. So I think 
you know, not all of it, obviously, but there's some key schedules that that would, <coughs> that would uh, I think, uh, work on. Thank you. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, you know, I've been following this on and off since 2018. Boy, there is big change between the and the hip today. Thank you. I thank all of you. You've done a great job. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, sir. Um, with seeing that, I'll close public comment and uh, we'll move into deliberations uh, 8.1, uh, the general assurance of federal programs. Um, just so the board knows, I did review it again. I did it last year um, as I have to initial it for, on behalf of the board. Um, I didn't see any changes, the same document as last year. Um, and that, I don't know if anyone else looked at it and had any questions on it. I will make arrangements to get it initial, and you've got one with you, so I can do that a little yeah. bit later once we close the meeting out. Um, so I'll move ahead with that. Um, 8.2 uh, FY25 HVAC purchase order. And I think, Lisa, you got this one? Yes. Um, so we had a meeting with the um, owner's project manager and EEI, who's doing our HVAC infrastructure project. And one of the discussions was, is how would we move forward with the um, maintenance contract on the controls for the HVAC systems? Um, we came up with um, the two schools that are getting their heating systems replaced, South School and Middle School. We're going to move the maintenance contract to E and E for next year. And all the other schools were going to remain with Siemens um, for the year. They still have the Siemens controls. Um, we want our staff to be comfortable with the new controls. Um, so we're going to keep it that way for this year, for next year. And then moving forward, I think the ultimate goal is to move all of the control maintenance um, over to E&E &E and to upgrade, change from Siemens controls to um, the back net, I believe it was called, controls on the rest of the schools. But that will be over time. Um, but next year, I think our staff was more comfortable um, keeping the maintenance contract. And when we broke it down um, with what Siemens um, package would be for the entire district. There's like a ten thousand dollars savings um, doing it this way. So it is our recommendation to split the two. E and E um, has a controls for middle and south school for twenty one thousand seven fifty, and Siemens will keep the high school, high school gym, Matthew Thornton North and South for thirty eight thousand nine hundred. Just a little back history. This is basically our service agreement um, with Siemens for uh, coming out and calibrating our uh, switches and um, the boilers and that, um, working with our staff internally to uh, make any adjustments digitally in that. And uh, E and E is, as you know, we awarded for the project of the infrastructure. We'll be completely taking over the two schools and where we put the high school off one year, that you know now gives us time to work through it. And uh, the staff, actually, e E's been very good. They've invited them out to several other locations to train our staff on new equipment that they're putting in other school districts. So I think Joe's been, you know, real comfortable with uh, He's and having the time to get out to these other facilities mm -hmm. uh, to learn the new system. And E yep. um, E's been very collaborative with our whole group about how they just don't go away when the project's completed, that we've probably got them for well well into a year's time of the transition time, so. And we still had a lot of, um, as, as our HVAC uh, tech had told us, we have still a lot of parts, seen parts. parts. Um, so it, it does behoove us to, yeah. to keep that for probably the year, and we'll see as, as things start failing, yep. um, how we upgrade them at, and at what pace. But for next year, I think we all thought this was the best way to go. Yep. And um, I think we're good. Do you need a vote on this, Lisa? I don't, I don't need a it's just, vote. you're just bringing the information forward. It's part of our, our budget. Purchasing. New policy. Purchasing policy. Yes, so that's in there. Yeah. So it's it's covered under that. You've done your yeah. due diligence okay. and, and that. So I think we're good. But I appreciate the update. Okay. And there's and, a. And then the other purchase that we would be putting through is um, part of South School. They're taking the tanks out, and um, they are replacing with propane tanks. So 
uh, EEI bid that out, and he had Grimes quote at a dollar fifty four a gallon um, for the propane, which would be our cost next year. Um, EEI would be taking on the cost of replacing the tanks. Right. Uh, but that's on them. That's not our our cost. That that's part of their contract. Yep. Um, but with that, it came the commitment to buy the propane from Rhymes. From Rhymes. And that was um, the best the best pricing that we had. And is, is that a year, two year, three year? That's a one year. One year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. And I think there was a pretty good savings going with Rhymes between the three bidders, the uh, three or four there bidders was, they had? There was one other bidder that had the same price per gallon, but, but the, the cost tanks. of the tanks was less. Yeah. So it was better in the big picture uh, for EEI and yeah. us uh, to go with the, um, right. the lower price on the tanks. Obviously, there was a savings for them there. Great job. And I know I've sat in on some of these meetings, um, you know, every couple of weeks, and it seems like E&E is doing their job on behalf of the district, yeah. you know, so far um, with trying to get us the best pricing in some of these areas so that's that's a good sign but thanks thanks for all this information all right and guess what we're on to policies we're on to policies <laughs> all right so if we start off with the second ADA. reading of ABA yeah second reading of ABA which is um, volunteer involvement now, if I heard the board last week, um, that policy previously was called community involvement in decision making, and there was some concern with eliminating that policy. So um, we are putting together, putting forward the, the first reading of um, KCB, Correct. which is that exact policy, community involvement. So we aren't rescinding that at all. It's just moving to, to the section, community Appreciate section that. that it belongs. So ABA, volunteer involvement, <coughs> second reading is as it was. Um, but I think I took care of the concern on, on that. Yep, yep. Okay. you did. Thank you. All right, I'll start with the uh, 8.3 second reading to amend policy ABA volunteer involvement. Um, I, this is basically what Lisa just explained. Um, KCB will cover it, so I will look for a motion to approve the second reading to amend policy ABA volunteer involvement, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Kevin. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to 8.4, first reading to adopt policy KCB, community involvement and decision making. Any questions on this? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion to approve the first reading or waive the first reading to adopt policy KCB, community involvement in decision making. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye zero. 8.5, third reading to adopt policy ACN, nursing mother's accommodations. I didn't see any changes or that. No, so I'd look for a motion to um, Accept the third reading to adopt policy ACN, nursing mother's accommodations, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Tim. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. 8.6, third reading to amend policy AD, educational philosophy. No changes on that. So I'll look for a motion to adopt, the, uh, approve the third reading to amend policy AD educational philosophy, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Kevin. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. 8.7, third reading to adopt policy ADB, drug-free workplace and drug-free schools. I didn't see any changes from the second reading. So I will look for a motion to adopt the third reading, uh, the third reading to adopt policy ADB, drug-free workplace and drug-free schools, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Eight point eight. The third reading to rescind policy GBK, employee use or abuse of drugs and alcohol. Again, no changes to this. So I look for a motion. To accept the third reading to rescind policy GBK, employee use or abuse of drugs and alcohol, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Tim. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 8.9, third reading to rescind policy GBKA, drug-free workplace. Again, no changes to this one. So I look for a motion to approve the third reading to rescind policy GBKA, drug-free workplace, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Kevin. All those in favor? Aye. 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 5-0. Uh, 8.10. 8.10. Third reading to adopt policy ABC, tobacco products ban use and possession in and on school facilities. I didn't see any changes from the second reading. So I look for a motion to approve the third reading to adopt policy ABC, tobacco products ban use and possession in and on school facilities, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 8.11, third reading to rescind policy GBKB, tobacco products ban. Uh, no changes to this from the second reading. Uh, so I'll look for a motion to approve the third reading to rescind policy GBKB, tobacco products ban, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Tim. All those in favor? Aye. 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 5-0. 8.12, this was carried over, yes. and you want to explain a little before yep. I get into this? Yes, Please. so policy AE was originally called School District Goals and Objectives, and if I heard the board right at the last meeting, they uh, wanted to retain that policy. So we recoded it to policy ADA. So we're going to resend the old policy AE and adopt ADA. So it's the same policy, just recoding it to uh, make the coding uniform. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. I'm good with that. All right. 8.12, first reading to rescind policy AE, school district goals and objectives. Any other questions on that? Lisa, just fine. Seeing none, I'll look for a motion to approve the first reading to rescind policy AE school district goals and objectives, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Kevin. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Eight point one three is the first reading to adopt policy ADA school district goals and objectives. Um, any questions? I'll look for a motion to approve first reading to adopt policy ADA, school district goals and objectives, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Eight point one four is the third reading to rescind policy AG accomplishments reporting to the public. Any questions on this? Yeah, so Lisa, on this one, it had referenced um, that it was basically backing policy AE, which I know we are rescinding in place of ADA. Why are we rescinding this instead of just amending it to reference ADA instead? It was always being rescinded because with that new. Wasn't it another one somewhere? where there was some accountability. So I understood that ADA was right. placing AE. I just didn't see why we were also rescinding AG. I mean, I understand that it well, wouldn't make sense where it's referencing AE anymore because mm -hmm. we've rescinded AE, but it would seem like it should now reference ADA instead. We can keep it if you want and just change the reference. It will have an amendment on the next read. Yeah. On the AG. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense, so guys? It, it, it I does. think what we had done when, when AE was accountability, that sort of addressed all of that, but mm -hmm. we rescinded that. So we can keep this one and, and amend it to okay. that reference of the new policy. So what? So we're just going to basically cross out AE and put ADA in. 
Yeah. 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 That's fine. He wants to keep AG. Yeah. Keep right. keep yeah, just amend it. Yeah, just amend it. I'll all. have to bring it forward. And yeah, so we'll just wait, we'll, we'll pass on this one. Yeah. yeah. Come back next time. Yeah. Third reading to adopt policy DAF administrations of federal grants. Again, I didn't see any changes from the second reading on this one. Uh, I will look for a motion to approve the third reading to adopt policy DAF administration of federal grants, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Tim. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. <clears throat> 8.16, third reading to rescind policy DBG, budget hearings. Again, there's no changes that I saw from the second. Um, I'll look for a motion to approve the third reading to rescind policy DBG, budget hearings, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Kevin. All those in favor? Aye. 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 8.17, third reading to rescind policy DBH, budget adoption procedures. I didn't see any changes from third to second, as far as I've seen. Um, I look for a motion to approve the third reading to rescind policy DBH, budget adoption procedures, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. 8.18. Third reading to amend policy DBC, budget preparation. I didn't see any changes on this one uh, as well from the second. Um, seeing none, I'll look for a motion to approve the third reading to amend policy DBC, budget preparation, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Tim. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. 8.19, third reading to rescind policy DBE, determination of budget priorities. Again, no changes from the second reading. Um, I'll look for a motion to approve the third reading to rescind policy DBE, determination of budget priorities, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Kevin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, five zero. 8.20. Third reading to rescind policy DBF, development of budget recommendations. Again, I see no changes from second to third. And so I'll look for a motion to approve the third reading to rescind policy DBF, development of budget recommendations, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. 8.21, third reading to adopt policy DBI, budget implementation, please. Um, no changes on this as well from the second to the third. Uh, so I'll look for an approval of the third reading to adopt policy DBI, budget implementation, please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Tim. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you. So we'll just look for that one to come back at the next meeting. Appreciate it. Um, Dan, you got anything to finish up with? You're good. You're good. Okay. Kevin, anything? Nope. Kevin? All set. Sarah? Amanda, good. Jay? And All set. Lisa? All set. Thank you. All right. All right. I will uh, look for a motion to go into non public session requested under RSA 91A colon 3 section 2 B and C please. So moved. Motion by Sarah. Second. Second by Kevin. I'll ask for a roll call vote starting to my left please. Aye Kevin Gray. Aye Tim Porter. Aye Bob Slater. Aye Sarah Lundy. 